at Welcome to Stat Stuff. I'm Matt Hansen. In this lesson, I'll introduce you to the control chart called the Individuals Moving Range Chart, or also known as the IMR chart. It's essential that you first review the lesson for finding the right control chart so you can be confident that the IMR chart is the right one for your situation. But for now, let's start with a review of how to read control charts. Well, how do you read control charts? Well, control charts plot the data points, usually using continuous type of data. Over time, they define a few things for us. They first define the observations, the data points from the data set that should be in a pre-sorted order, like a date-time order. Also, it will plot for us the mean, the average for all the data points. Also, the lower control limit, which represents three standard deviations below that mean, and the upper control limit, which is three standard deviations above the mean. Also, it would include any special cost tests, which could be any of eight different rules that could be predefined that help identify any potential special causes in the data. So just as a way of illustration, we can look at a particular control chart example, which tends to be similar for most of the control charts that we'll be looking at. First within this control chart, you can see that all the observation points are being highlighted here. We can see that there are 20 different observations that should be reflected here in time, like a date and time order, starting from the left all the way to the right. And then we also plot on here the mean, that is the average for the entire data set. All these observations, the average is reflected here within our sample average. Then we've got an upper control limit, which is three standard deviations above the mean. And then we've got a lower control limit reflected as three standard deviations below the mean. Then we have over here this region that falls within the red lines. This is the expected variation region, where that's where we would expect there to be some common cause variation falling back and forth around the mean, hopefully not falling outside of these upper and lower control limits, which is our unexpected variation region. That's where we might see some obvious special causes when they fall outside of our upper and lower control limits that are defined here by the red lines. And we also see in this example, there's one data point that falls below into that area. So we can say for this observation number seven, it failed the test because the data point fell outside of the lower or upper control limit area. Now, one thing to keep in mind that's really important is that control limits that are used in here in charts like this are not the same thing as spec limits, which is the LSL or US or USL. The spec limits are usually going to be tied to the voice of the customer, what the customer wants, the requirements that they set. Those are the targets. That's what the spec limits refer to. Control limits, though, are just reflecting how the process is performing of whether it's in control based off of the variation in, rel in relationship to the mean. So it's based off of three standard deviations from the mean. So you can have a process that's actually considered to be in control, but not necessarily meet the customer's requirements defined by the upper and lower spec limits as well as vice versa. All right, now let's more specifically dive into defining the IMR chart. Well, the IMR chart is actually a combination of two different charts that are used together. First, the I refers to the individual data points that are being plotted, and the MR refers to the moving range of those individual data points, that is, the absolute distance between each successive data point. So just as in the individual's chart, the moving range is going to display for us the lower control limit and upper control limits and apply the same types of special cost tests for us. So here's an example of how Minitab will calculate the moving range for us. So here we might have the actual raw data point in the left-hand column where we might have a 2, 5, 3, and so on. So what it does is it takes the distance between the 2 and the 5, and that difference is 3. Then it takes the 5 and the 3, and the distance of that is 2. Then 3 and 1, and the distance of that is 2 and so on for all of these just to calculate for us the absolute difference between each of these data points in succession. So what are the requirements for the chart itself? Well, the plotted data that we're using should be continuous data, as they should be using numerical values. And there shouldn't be any rational subgrouping in the data. That is, there shouldn't be any subgroups that already exist in it. So for accessing it within Minitab, this is where you go to the stat menu, select control charts, then variable charts for individuals, then choose IMR. Now let's look at an example of the IMR chart. Well, here's an example of what the IMR chart might look like when you output some data in it. And here you might see the distance between here. Here's a data point that falls really low, and there's another one that falls above the mean. Well, the distance between these data points seem pretty extreme. The distance that's reflected here is the distance that's reflected within the moving range portion. So this value up here is so high because the distance between these two is so long. So that's what we mean when we say it's tracking the moving range. Now, the fact that this happens 
happens to be a failed data point does not necessarily mean this is always going to be a failed data point as well. We could have had this data point fall just above the lower control limit and this one be even higher and still have a long distance between them and it would still fail down here because it would have been beyond the three standard deviations above the mean for the moving range area. So again, just because you have a failed point in the individuals doesn't necessarily mean you're going to have a failed point down in the moving range and vice versa between the two of them. Another thing to observe here is because we're dealing with moving range, you're not going to have a data point for the first observation point. So because of that, it's always going to be blank here. So that's normal to see that. As well, it's normal to see the lower control limit that's always going to be zero. It has to be zero because what's tracking in the moving range are the absolute values. And absolute values will all be, always be reflected as a positive value. So that's why the lowest lower control limit that could be reflected here is zero. However, that's not to say that the average would not be something different and it's still going to measure the upper control limit at three standard deviations above the, the sample moving range that's being used, moving range average that is. But again, a lower control limit, it's normal for it to be reflected as zero only within this moving range section. All right, before we close this lesson, let's discuss how we can apply some of these concepts in a practical way. I'd like you to identify at least two different critical metrics that you use in your organization that are at least based off of continuous values. And try to acquire some sorted historical data for each of those metrics that would include at least 20 different data points. And try running them through the IMR chart. Again, it's essential that you at least sort them through a date or time stamp so that way the oldest represent is represented first all the way down to the most current. And then ask yourself the following questions for each of those metrics. For the individual's chart, the upper portion of the IMR chart, was there any data point that failed the first test, that is where it's falling outside of the lower or upper control limits? If so, then can you explain what caused that failure? And does it appear to be a special or maybe a common cause variation? And then for the moving range chart, which is the lower portion of the IMR chart, was there any data point that was failing that first test? And if so, what would be the cause for that failure? Does it appear to be something that's also a special cause or maybe a, a common cause type of variation? Now if there were any failures that were noted, then what would be the actions that you should take in order to fix those errors and help prevent future failures from occurring? Well that wraps up this lesson. Check out statstuff.com for many more resources that can help you achieve powerful results. I'm Matt Hansen. Thanks for watching.